All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A physical therapist is setting a goal for a patient to improve balance. Which of the following goals is stated in observable and measurable terms? Pretty straightforward definition question, right? We want operational definitions that we can observe and measure on a reliable basis. So if we have a situation where a therapist needs a goal for a patient to improve balance, how are we going to best define that in both observable and measurable terms? A, the patient will maintain balance while standing on one leg without any external support during four out of five trials over a two-week period. This is a pretty good definition. We know exactly what it looked like, looks like standing on one leg, no external support, and we have a way to measure it. A looks very good. Let's look at the rest of our answer choices. B, the patient will feel more stable and confident while performing balancing activities as reported by self-assessment surveys at the end of each session. We do have a measurement procedure here, but it's going to be very indirect because it's all self-reported, which means it's just not going to be as consistently measurable as A. C, the patient will improve overall balance during therapy sessions by completing various exercises with fewer reported falls. We still didn't define balance with C, so that's a problem. We have to define what do we mean to improve balance. D, the patient will show enhanced postural stability, demonstrating an increased ability to recover from minor shifts in weight over the course of treatment. Again, not terrible, but it's still subjective. What does it mean to demonstrate ability to recover? And we don't have a measurement either. So A is still going to be our best answer choice to define this in observable and measurable terms. A cooking instructor is teaching a student to prepare a complex recipe. She starts by having the student complete the last step, garnishing the dish, following prompts for the prior steps. Gradually, the student learns to complete more steps until they can perform the entire sequence independently. What type of chaining is being used? So we have a task chain question. And when we have a task chain question, we typically want to ask ourselves, where are we starting? If we're starting from the front, it's typically forward. From the back, it's typically backward. If we're teaching the whole thing, it's total task. In this case, the cooking instructor is teaching a recipe. She has the student complete the last step following prompts for the prior steps. So immediately, we should identify this as what? Well, as a backwards chain. If we are having the learner independently do the last step after prompts for the other steps, then we're starting from the, from the back and we're going backwards. The type of chaining here is backwards chaining. Skinner is experimenting with different response rates with his pigeons. He starts to reinforce norm the pigeons sometimes on a FR5 schedule and sometimes on a VI2 schedule without changing anything else about the environment. What type of schedule is Skinner using? We have a compound schedule question. How do we know? Well, we have two schedules going at once. Question wants to know what type of schedule is this? Well, when we have a single behavior and we have multiple reinforcement schedules operating on that behavior, that's either going to be a multiple or a mixed schedule. With a concurrent schedule, we're going to have two behaviors or more with two or more schedules, right? Each one has their own independent schedule. And then a chain schedule is a sequence of schedules that have to be completed in a row. How do we know the difference between a mixed and a multiple? Well, a mixed does not have a SD signaling what is available when a multiple does. So if if Skinner is just rotating through these schedules without signaling the availability of what schedule is available, then that's going to be a mixed schedule. A marathon runner wants to increase her speed in the middle portion of the marathon. She finds herself slowing down and running with less intensity during this part of the marathon. She knows what intervention she wants to use, but she does not want to remove the intervention at any point. What design should she choose? Okay, we have an experimental design question, and we have to pick the design for this runner. What do we know about the runner? She wants to increase her speed in the middle portion of the marathon. So she wants to increase a behavior she already has. She just wants to go faster. She feels she is going slower with less intensity. She also knows what intervention she wants to use. 
but she doesn't want to remove the intervention at any point. With these facts, what can we rule out? We can rule out reversal design because she doesn't want to remove the intervention. We can rule out an alternating treatment because she knows the intervention she wants to use. So that leaves us with a multiple probe and a changing criterion. Well, since she's targeting a singular behavior that is already in her repertoire and she just wants to increase it, a changing criterion design is likely going to be best. She doesn't have to remove the intervention. She can target that singular behavior and systematically increase as she goes with her chosen intervention. A teacher is working with a student on decreasing outbursts and an increasing calm communication when the student wants to leave the classroom. The teacher only allows the student to leave when they say, can I take a break calmly, but does not allow the student to leave if the student has an outburst. Over time, the student starts asking calmly to take breaks more often compared to outburst. What process does this scenario illustrate? So it's a procedure question or an intervention question. And with these questions, we have to figure out what did we do and what was the outcome? We know the teacher was working with a student on decreasing outbursts and increasing calm communication. So we're decreasing something and increasing something else. Immediately, we want to think differential reinforcement. The teacher only allowed the student to leave when they said, can I take a break, but not if they had an outburst. Eventually, what happened? Well, the student is now asking calmly to take breaks compared to outbursts. So the intervention was successful. The student is engaging in the alternative response more consistently. What does that illustrate? A, differential reinforcement of other behaviors. Well, a DRO does not teach a replacement. So this cannot be a DRO procedure. B, differential reinforcement of diminishing rates of behavior. This procedure also does not teach a replacement. This teacher taught the replacement of calm communication. She didn't just target the outburst. So it can't be a DRO or a DRD. What about punishment? Well, there's no punishment present here. She used extinction. She used reinforcement. So actually, this is going to be response differentiation, which is a little challenging because it appears to be all about the teacher. But since A, B, and C are not correct, we have to look at the student who is now differentiating between calm communication and outburst. So this process or the scenario illustrates response differentiation. A manager is developing a new set of workplace rules to increase employee compliance with safety procedures. The manager wants the rules to be effective and followed consistently by all staff. Which of the following criteria should the manager prioritize when designing these rules? So this is a question about rules and rules are verbal contingencies where the behavior and the consequence are stated, but the contingency is never met because a rule controls behavior without having to meet the consequence. So if this manager has a new set of rules to increase employee compliance, how should he design those rules? A, the rule should be broad and cover as many scenarios as possible related to the safety procedures. Since the rules are verbal statements controlling behavior, you don't want them to be broad. You want them to be very, very precise. This is what you need to do. This is the consequence for doing that thing. So B, the rule should be specific and describe the consequences that come along with the rules is a better way to design rules. C, the rule should be relatively vague to allow flexibility. Rules, again, should be very precise. If you do this, then you do this. It's just like a contingency, except it's simply a verbal statement where the contingency doesn't actually take place, but the behavior is still controlled by that verbal rule. So you want it to be very specific. And then D, the rule should be complex with detailed explanations on what needs to be done. Now, the simpler, the better. You should just be very specific, describe the consequences, and keep it as simple as possible, right? You always want to try to be parsimonious. The director of lighting for a major Broadway production is walking his new intern through the entire process of running a show from start to finish. He tells the intern that tomorrow he will need to do the beginning of the show by himself, but then he'll receive assistance for the rest of the show. What strategy does this resemble? All right, so we have another chaining question. Let's take the same approach. Where are we starting? Where is this director starting? Well, he's got his intern. We're going from start to finish. The intern has to do the beginning of the show by himself, and then we'll get assistance or prompts for the rest. 
So if we're starting at the front and then prompting through the rest, that is going to be a forward chaining procedure. Backwards chaining, we're starting from the end. Total task chaining, we're teaching the whole chain. And the behavior chain interruption strategy, we're interrupting that chain. Chaining questions are not that difficult. We just have to be really cognizant of where we are starting in the chain. A restaurant manager wants to reduce employee burnout by implementing a policy where members of the wait staff receive a 15 minute break every three hours, regardless of the number of customers served during that period. What type of schedule is the manager using? Okay, we have a schedule question and it's a little more tricky because we have a couple things going on. What do we know so far? We know the manager wants to give the wait staff a 15 minute break every three hours. So let's start there. So if every three hours we are getting reinforced, it's fixed, it's based on time. So this is similar to a fixed interval three hours where every interval of three hours you're getting reinforcement. Now, second, no matter what, regardless of the number of customers served, they are getting reinforcement. So it's not contingent on anything. No matter what, every three hours, the staff gets a 15-minute break. There is no contingency. The manager actually removed the, the contingency. So how would we describe this? A, a contingent fixed interval schedule. Well, it's not contingent on anything. No matter how many customers are served, they're getting that break. What about a non-contingent fixed ratio schedule? Well, it's not a ratio schedule because it's dependent on time. Contingent fixed interval schedule. It is a fixed interval, but it's not contingent. So that leaves us with D, a non-contingent fixed interval schedule. A little more tricky, but we just have to simply go slow and break down the question and answer everything given in that question. Last night, as Sam was turning off the light in her son's room, a tree branch snapped, which caused a loud popping noise, leading to Sam covering his ears. Sam's son now covers his ears when the light is turned off in his room. What is the unconditioned stimulus in this scenario? When we are dealing with unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned reflexes, it's going to help if you can try and label each. So what do we know about this scenario? We know Sam was turning off the light, a tree branch snapped, loud popping noise, which caused Sam to cover his ears. So the popping noise is an unconditioned stimulus, which led to the unconditioned reflex of covering ears. Now, Sam covers his ears, which is a conditioned reflex, when the light is turned off, which is a conditioned stimulus. Why is that conditioned? Well, it was paired with the tree branch snapping and the loud noise. So given this breakdown, what is the unconditioned stimulus? A, the light turning off. The light turning off is now a conditioned stimulus. B, the tree branch snapping. It wasn't the tree branch snapping, but rather the noise that led to the reflex. Sam covering his ears is the unconditioned reflex here and also the conditioned reflex here. And then the popping noise. The popping noise was the original unconditioned stimulus, which was then paired, which created a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned reflex. A teacher observes that students are more engaged and attentive during math lessons right after recess when they've had a chance to release energy. To improve participation in math activities, the teacher schedules the most challenging lessons immediately after recess. What concept is the teacher using? So think about what this teacher is trying to consider. The teacher knows or sees that students are more engaged and attentive during math after recess. So what does she do? She puts the most challenging lessons immediately after recess. Why? Well, through her observation, she can see after a release of energy, they're more attentive. So what concept is she using? Is she A, manipulating motivating operations, B, manipulating discriminative stimuli, C, implementing stimulus deltas, or D, differential reinforcement? Well, it's not going to be differential reinforcement because there's no sign of extinction in this particular question. It's just more of a planning strategy. What about implementing stimulus delta? Stimulus delta signaled the unavailability of something. She's not making anything unavailable. She's just saying after energy's gone, they're more likely to participate. So what she's doing is manipulating motivating operations where for whatever reason, the motivation to participate in math activities is higher 
following recess. So she is taking advantage of that, manipulating motivating operations and using that to her advantage to teach her students. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and like on YouTube. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.